guys, welcome to another episode of Odds Hoopers TV. Today we have on Kyle Adnan, uh, backup point guard for Southeast Melbourne Phoenix last year. Uh, put up career best numbers, averaging 13 points, four assists, three boards. Um, Southeast came up short last year. Uh, big piece in the NBL, obviously local guard. Um, grew up in Melbourne, played for Kilsyth. Um, obviously represented Australia as well, so we're very excited to see what Kyle has to say and pick his brains a little bit. What's up, Kyle? How you doing? Good, fellas. Thanks for having me. How you doing? Not too bad. Um, thanks for coming on. We know it's time consuming, but we appreciate it. Um, congrats on the new two-year extension. Uh, very well deserved. Obviously, a big part of what Southeast were doing last year. Um, one of the biggest surprises last season, obviously, contender for most improved. Um, so congrats on the two-year extension. Um, you put together a career best last year, 12 points, uh, almost four assists. And you guys came close in the series last year with Melbourne United. Run us through that series, first of all. Um, obviously, heartbreaking loss. You guys look like you had it. Talk about talk about that series and what you learned from it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a um, it was an interesting series for us. It was probably a uh, a tale of two games. We uh, game one uh, obviously was a bit disappointing. Um, we just kind of didn't play the brand of basketball that we had kind of shown. I think consistency for us was a big one last year, just trying to find that. And through injuries and other things that had happened throughout the year to our group, um, you know, getting a team on the floor and building that chemistry was tough. And I, I feel like we, we finally hit our stripes come finals. Game one was a bit difficult. Uh, game two, we took it back uh, pretty comfortably and, and had a really good game. And then um, game three, we were up you know, 17 in the second quarter. And, um, you know, as great teams do and championship teams do, they, they clawed back and, um, yeah, Jock was obviously a handful. And then the guys that they spaced the floor with around him um, and our sort of defensive scheme to, to send an extra body at him on the block was, um, they just picked us apart in that game. So credit to them. Um, yeah, definitely disappointing, but has, has lit a fire in us for sure to, to get back there again in our third year. For sure. What about, what about personal? Uh, how do you think you went personally? Uh, it was a bit of a difficult series. I mean, um, as we saw, Kiefer had a big assignment with Chris uh, Goulding. So, um, yeah, it was kind of, he was defensively guarding Goulding a lot. Um so obviously his minutes were a bit more extended. So for me, little less minutes in the, in the series than, um, you know, as coaches and myself have discussed, we would have liked, but um, sometimes when someone's rolling like Kiefer was um, and an incredible player, as we now see him in the NBA um, with the paces for the preseason, um, you kind of just got to let guys rock a little bit. And I think Kiefer was doing an incredible job that series. So um, in the minutes I came in, you know, I was efficient and whatnot, but um yeah, it would have been great to have a little bit more of a, an impact in some way. But as I said, Kiefer was just incredible that series. So we had to uh, let him ride. He was. Um, let's talk about this year. Obviously, how's training camp so far? I think you guys have started training camp from what I've seen on um, the socials. Um, I saw a couple of imports have landed. Um, how's the vibe of the team feeling? Yeah, good. We, um, yeah, we kind of got our core group back together, which I think was a really important piece. Um, of the puzzle for us um, yeah we kind of adding some length inside defensively um, is something we've probably missed the last few years a bit of rim protection and just that second line of defense to anchor your defense um, so that'll be great with Joe Chi coming in um, and yeah just getting those same core guys together preseason has been great we're already sort of uh, levels above where you typically are in a preseason just because we do have that core group of guys together and um, yeah, you know, pre-seasons can be a bit of a grind, but we've got a great group and uh, it's definitely been a tough first few weeks. Yeah, nice. So talking about talking about this season, uh, what, are the, what are the expectations you guys have? Have you started talking about goals and, and what you guys want to achieve this season? Obviously, you're on the brink last year. I'm assuming championships on the cards. Is that, is that the goal? Yeah, for sure. I think, um, I think the belief in our group is really important. Um, I think a lot of teams want to win a championship, but deep down, if they've got that want or belief, um, and I think the belief's higher than it's ever been um, for our group, um, which I think is a great space for everyone to be in mentally um, going into the year. 
I think the having the core group of guys back together, same coaching staff um, and all that stuff has just been great for us as a group. Um, and then obviously, you know, fine tuning a few pieces and different things happen with NBA guys going in and out and whatnot. And I think we've signed some great imports too. And I think it's, um, you know, the, the ball's in our court. And I think if we can stay healthy and stay consistent, I think we definitely can make a push for it for sure. Sure. Yeah, I agree with that. I think... I read somewhere that you, you touched on it earlier. You said it lit a fire that, you know, that heartbreaking, the way it ended kind of last last playoff run. Um, I read somewhere that your coach was was going to play back game three of you guys losing to Melbourne. Has he has he gone through that yet this preseason? Uh, he hasn't yet. I think he'll probably wait for everyone to get in town. And, um, yeah, I've already watched it a couple of times, so. I think he's just going to throw a bit more salt in the wounds, but um, that's all right. We, we, we should do it together. And I think as Simon said, it'd probably be a good little exercise to sort of, um, you know, relight that spark a little bit. For sure. Um, for any Southeast Melbourne fans watching, uh, can you give, can you give them a little bit of scoop on uh, any, any more signings Southeast have to do, or maybe possibly the third import? Are you allowed to do that? Oh, uh, what's, well, Oh, I wish I was in the uh, the GM meetings um, and that had that kind of pull. That would be great. But unfortunately, I'm not. So, um, you know, I know they had mentioned that we were looking for another big um, in an article. Um, yeah, but I, I, I really don't know, to be honest. I think um, the coaching staff will kind of make that decision in the next week or so with NBA guys sort of getting cut from rosters and things. So um, I think the... A uh, pool of talent available is really great right now. So I think that works in our favour. And I think um, Australia now being a bit of a destination league is awesome. So for the teams that are able to wait, um, you know, this is the time of year where you can really hit some big names and, um, you know, get those really sort of game changers and, and guys who are big game players. And if we want to be a, a really good playoff team, they're the kind of guys that you've got to add to your roster. Yeah. You, you touch on something there that I just want to explore a little bit. I think, Obviously, you're uh, part of the senior leadership group there at Southeast Melbourne and you've been in the NBL for a number of years. Do decisions that get made on a management level come across you at all? Do they pick your brain on things like that? Just to, to give fans, I guess, that don't understand the inner workings of a professional club, how does that process go about and what's your input into those situations? I think it... Uh... I think it starts with our end of season review. So we all have reviews and sort of discuss, um, particularly the leadership group, discuss areas we think that we need to get better at, areas that we're great at, um, you know, and all the things that go into actually running a basketball club and, and getting a championship team on the floor. Um, I think obviously when it comes to decision-making and scouting and watching video and film of guys, um, you know, that process is the coaches and the GMs and, and they're the ones who are going to make that decision for sure. But, um, you know, discussions post-season are really important, um, especially from a playing perspective about things that you may see um, or think that could benefit the group. And, um, you know, we've got a really open and honest team. And on some teams, you're able to have that conversation. Um, on, on others, maybe not. Um, so, yeah, but ultimately it's the GM and the coaching decision for sure. Nice. And just talking about the, the MBL as well, just one little little question about it. Like I mentioned, you've been around in the league for a number of years and I think you're going into your ninth season. Is that right? Eighth or ninth season? Uh, eighth, I think. Yeah. Young so, vet. <laughs> yeah, young vet. Exactly right. Um, how do you feel the, the landscape has changed of the MBL? And talk to us a little bit about uh, yeah, that landscape and how exciting it is uh, for a time in Australian basketball with the league doing what it's doing. Oh, it's, it's incredible. And um, I think to have kind of been a part of that transition a little bit has been really cool to see. Um, one thing that's always been there is the talent level in Australia. Um, in terms of basketball, the talent pool that we've always had has been great. Um, I think, you know, through those down periods um, I think it's purely been sort of a marketing and and financial thing that's sort of held back um, but now that those things have merged I think that the entertainment value you get at a game um, you know the ESPN deals the TV deals the free-to-air TV deals etc all those things are just huge and I think it's full credit to the NBL Larry people who Jeremy who have worked really hard to get this as a product and 
Um, the talent level was there, and I think it, it's been able to be put on display. You know, NBA preseason games um, and and the television stuff that I spoke about. Um, they're just so huge for the game, and and I think it's great for Australian fans as well to see the talent level in their country. And I think now more than ever, the Australian fan is really engaged. Um, whereas typically, you know, everyone watches the NBA. Me too. Love the NBA, um, but. Now I think that there's a real sort of, you know, I'm from Melbourne, I'm either South East or United, and, and, and there is a real Australian fan base growing, and I think that's really important for the NBL. Um, and I've loved seeing that over the last few years, just the amount of people that are engaged and, and keeping a close eye on the league itself. Sure. I think, I think like Hesh mentioned before, we're one of those leagues in the world where all nine or all ten teams now are competitive, like any, any night, uh, the worst team could take out the best team, you know. So I think it makes it much a much better watch, and I think the NBL definitely has a bright future. Um, we'll get into your early life and early years. Uh, talk to us about growing up in Melbourne. Um, you obviously played, correct us if I'm wrong, but you played junior basketball for the Mount Evelyn Meteors. Um, talk to us about growing up in Melbourne and playing junior basketball there. Uh, yeah, it's great. Obviously, Melbourne um, is an incredible place to grow up in terms of hoops. Um, I think 25% of the country's hoopers are in Melbourne. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of people who play basketball here. It's a big sport. Um, so yeah, just growing up, you know, I had a pretty typical childhood. Um, you know, I got three brothers, so we were always in the backyard sort of playing and uh, going at it. My older brother, Fraser, was um, four years older than me, bigger, stronger. Uh, my younger brother, Jordan, was he's 6'6 six, six now. He plays NBL 1 with Kilsyth. Um, and, you know, as a kid, I, I struggled just getting a win in my own backyard, really. Um, so I think for me, that's kind of where my love and feel for the game sort of came from. I had to kind of find ways to score over bigger, stronger defenders. Um, I had to use my quickness. I had to use timing, uh, you know, creating space, different things like that. And um, I constantly lost uh, uh, lost <clears throat> in the backyard, but I think um, I was learning a lot of lessons when I was out there as well, just how to lose, um, that things weren't always going to go my way. And, and I actually had to work harder to, to be better, especially being a smaller guard. So, um, you know, my backyards where a lot of things happen. I know you mentioned the Mount Evelyn Meteors, and then I played rep basketball at Kilsyth from under 11s all the way through to that Siebel program for one year before I started in the NBL. So uh, my pathway was, was purely uh, Victorian basketball. I never made a state team. Um, I, I was a bit of a late developer in terms of um, physically. I, I'm hoping I'm still growing, but I doubt it. Um, and yeah, so I think it all sort of came together, sort of top age under 18s for me. Yeah, nice. You, you just mentioned there, obviously, being a small stature player and, and having to rely on skill and timing and reads and probably outsmarting opponents like that in the backyard. How is that influenced and how does it continue to influence your, your impact? One of the things I love about watching you is I think you kind of play with a chip on your shoulder. I've seen you miss three, four shots in a row and then you come down and launch the next one. If you have half a look, like I, I enjoy watching that side of you and I, confidence is, is clearly there. So how do you, how, what's your advice to kind of other, other players who, who, you know, might be physically, not as big or there's opponents and, and how do they kind of, how have you combated that and how does that influence you now? Uh, I think, I think a lot of uh, smaller guards in particular and younger kids probably, they don't love hearing this message, but you actually have to work harder. Um, that's the fact of the matter. And, and there's no way to, to beat around that. You know, if there's a six, eight guy walking in the gym, who's an athlete, I'm telling you the coach is probably going to look at him first, but, it's the second and third look that you might get a look on. And I think it's really important to, to constantly be working. I knew if my skills weren't above and beyond the guy who was the athlete, you know, I, I had no, no chance. Um, so for me, it was skill development was really important. Um, I had to make sure my handle, the way I could, I could shoot, dribble, pass. I could score at three levels in the paint, mid-range three. Um, I knew I had to have all those things in my game. Um, to be able to be effective professional professionally. <clears throat> so I think, I know you hear a lot, the hard work cliche, but I truly really believe that. Like, I think it's a really important thing. I know I would go before school to Kilsyth and I'd be on the shooting gun for an hour. 
I'd go after school to kill Scythe. I'd be shoot on the shooting gun for an hour and then I'd train youth league, Siebel, you know, I'd spend, you know, 10 hours at that gym some days um, and just be in there all the time trying to get better. Um, so I think that that's really important. Um, and then that comes with self-belief as well. I think when you're well prepared, um, it, it's easy to believe in yourself. You know, if I trust that I've shot 500 threes during that week, uh, and I made 350 of them and I'm feeling good going into the weekend. You know, I don't mind missing a few because I feel like the next one's going down. So I think preparation is really important too. Yeah, that's, that's awesome to hear. So then we we jump across to your, your NBL career and your start. I'll just list off a couple of things here. Tell me if, if we've got it wrong. Um, but you you started in 2013 with Adelaide as a, as a DP for the 13-14 season. Um, and then a development player spot on the Wollongong Hawks when they were the Wollongong Hawks back then. And then 2015, you signed with Melbourne United on, on a deal. Uh, and then had a, a team high 16 points. So you started to, to, to make your mark in the NBL a little bit and then signed with, uh, played in the New Zealand NBL, went across over to there and then came back with the Kings in 2018. And then obviously a little mini camp with the Dallas Mavericks, a bit of NBA, NBA kind of experience there. And then you signed a, a two-year deal with Southeast Melbourne Phoenix, which is currently your home. Bit of a journeyman, been around the league a little bit and, and obviously seems like you found a home now. How challenging has the last eight years been? And also in correspondence, how rewarding has it been to finally find a home in Southeast Melbourne and, and be here for an extended period of time? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've definitely, um, I've definitely done the rounds. And I think one thing as an Australian basketballer, um, and as we mentioned, just spoke about before being a smaller guard, it, it took me a little bit to find my feet. And I think I remember after Adelaide, I signed in Wollongong. Um, and that was my first opportunity to make money playing basketball. So that was a big reason. Um, I got there and then they went into voluntary administration. Um, and that's why they're now the Illawarra Hawks. So um, when that whole process happened, I was not sure where I was actually going to play. Um, and at that time, I was playing Siebel at Kilsyth, and then obviously United uh, gave me a deal. So those little jumps were kind of, um, you know, those business side of things that was sort of changing that I kind of had to flow with. Um, I would have loved to have stayed where I was, but, um, you know, it kind of just worked out that way. And, and, and as all things do, they, they find a way to work out and you make the most of them. And I think ending up United was incredible. Um, we won a championship there. And I think that was when I really learned how to win and how to structure a game as a guard, um, you know, not just play the game. Um, and that was really important. Dean Vickerman was great. Uh, Goulding was a great veteran for me. He was my roommate. Um, Dave Anderson, Barlow, all those guys that I got to play with were great and just helping me grow. Um, then obviously I kind of started finding my own little niche and, um, you know, how I could be, a point guard in this league as an Australian, um, you know, as a local and, and be a leader on a team. Um, I think that's, it's a pretty tough position to get to, but I felt comfortable doing it. And um, obviously that led to an opportunity overseas, as you said, with, with Dallas for a bit. And then, um, yeah, back home, as you mentioned, and sort of found my spot, um, you know, being captain with the Phoenix and sort of um, having a voice and being a leader was something I always really wanted to do and, and felt strongly about. Um, so to be in the position I am now, I'm, I'm, I'm super grateful. And I think all those little journeys and bumps in the road and changes of scenery and thing at the time, they seem um, difficult, but uh, I think they're all really important in my journey and, and where I ended up now. Um, touch a bit more on the 2017-18 NBL season with United, obviously you touched on it a bit then you won the championship. Uh, run us through the emotions of running the cha uh, winning the championship and how much you learned that season. Obviously you guarded, Chris Goulding and Casper Ware, I think, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, in training. Yep. Um, so run us through that season and what you learned from it. Uh, yeah, it was just, a, it was a great season. I think um, that year I, I really sort of, you know, came out of my shell a little bit. Um, Casper went down, I think the first three games, he didn't play or two. I'm not hundred percent sure, which I got to start. And um, I think I had my career high that well that year for that year. And I, sort of had a couple of good games to start the year and was feeling good. I was feeling comfortable. I was a little bit stronger. Um, I know I was still light as a feather, but I'd put on about five kilos in that off season, which was really important for me. 
um, just to be able to hold my position and um, defend my position a bit better. Um, and then, you know, going at Casper every day was amazing. Um, we had some, we had some days, I uh, got a lot of respect for Casper and um, I think it's reciprocated, but you know, we had some days talking shit up and down the floor and just challenging each other. And Dino, Dean Vickham, and he, he really challenged that as well. He wanted me to do that to Casper every day that, um, you know, Casper was going to get their best defender on the weekend. So I needed to challenge him all week. And um, I definitely, in my mind, I was like, I don't want to give Casper a day off. He's not having a day off. Like I'm getting him up today. I'm running off screens. He's going to work. And I think um, he he really respected that. And I think come game time, I was re rewarded by Dino for those efforts as well and constantly challenging and putting pressure on the defense. And um, I think I might have played maybe nine, ten minutes a game that year we won. Um, I, I don't know, to be honest, but around that, and I think whenever Casper had a breather, it was exactly what we'd done in training. I'd sub him out and I would be pedal to the metal, go, 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 downhill, trying to create, score, constantly in attack mode. And I think that's kind of was great. And um, to be able to win a championship off that, you know, I saw Casper structuring a game in front of me. You know, he'd be distributing in the first quarter. You know, he'd, he'd get to the foul line, get the foul count up, putting pressure on that defense. Then come the, th come the third and fourth quarter, it was Hezzy pull up three. He hit four in a row, bang. You know, like he would just ice games. And the way he structured a game was just incredible. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's a good message for guards out there as well is, is figuring out how to structure a game. I think it's really important and getting other guys involved. So I learned so much from him. And then also on the flip side, seeing bigs like Dave Anderson, Goulding, guys who I'd watched up, uh, watched growing up. Um, Dave Anderson was great for me. A um, little bit of a story, but I, I wrote him a letter when I was 11, um, wishing him luck at the, the Olympics. And he actually wrote back to me and I still had that letter. And it was just sort of said, thanks for the well wishes, Kyle. And I wish you all the best in your endeavours. And, um, you know, however many years later, we're on a championship team together. So those kind of little things, you, you, you pinch yourself and you think, shit, that was cool. That was really cool. And, um, yeah, you know, you win a championship together, you got you got to bond for life together. So I still speak to all those guys quite often, just not on game night when we play them. <laughs> That's cool, man. That's some good insight there through your career. Just want to take it to a, a little bit of a different topic. There's been a, I don't know if you've been following on the socials, but a bit of a debate going on amongst the, the younger demographic about which state um, produces the best basketball players nationwide. Um, <laughs> what's your take on it and which state are you picking an all-time all-time team from a state who are you picking oh well i gotta go with victoria man i just think uh if uh, in particular being a kill like a kill scythe kid you know we had 10 like powerhouse basketball clubs within a 25 kilometer radius like powerhouse big big time clubs um, you know, those VC under 14s, Victorian Championship, 14s, 16s, 18s, like that was tough basketball. Uh, it was good. So i got to go with the Vicks, man. Uh, of course, maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I will say this, though. I think all the other states uh, with the infrastructure and everything that's coming along have just done wonders for basketball as well. You know, Victoria have always typically won those state and national titles, but these other states are coming right now. So we, we got our work cut. Our juniors have got their work cut out for them for sure. Um, you've talked about Kilsyth a lot. Um, obviously, your junior club growing up, you obviously, you know, have that in your heart, that club. Um, can we, the NBL one is kind of growing really big recently. Uh, it's obviously, you know, on the come up. Can, is there any chance we could see you suit up for them in the NBL one if it's in the off season? Um, oh, I mean, it's, it's definitely never off the cards. I think, uh, you know, at this stage of my career, I've been sort of, um, you know, trying to get overseas a little bit more and, and, and do a little bit more things like that, you know, whether it's mini camps overseas and, um, you know, they've always got a place in my heart for sure. But, um, yeah, at this stage of my career, I'm kind of pushing in a little bit of a different direction, but, um, I'd love to finish up my career there for sure. Um, what other, what other goals will go and get into the future? Uh, what other goals do you have for yourself within the sport for the future? Obviously, you just said overseas and mini camps. Is there anything else? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd love to. I've obviously done Boomer's stuff before. Um, I've yeah. been a part of that, which is incredible. But um, 
for me, I'd love to be involved in sort of the major tournaments and, um, you know, put my best foot forward. Um, you know, in terms of, of basketball, I still am young and I still do have time on my side, but at the same time, I am pushing into those better years of my of my career and my body. Um, so I really would love to, you know, whether it's World Cup, Olympics, those things are, are, are really high on my list and um, we've got an incredible team. So it, it's no easy task, but I think, you know, with hard work and, and a few chips falling my way, I think I can definitely do it. I just got to, you know, keep the, uh, keep backing myself in. For sure. Oh, from a sp- specific, um, what do you, what do you think? Just, just being reflective about your own game. What do you think is the, the areas of, you know, growth and development and what are you kind of focusing on from an individual standpoint right now? Yeah, for sure. Well, I think, um, you know, for me, as we just mentioned, my goal is to international basketball. So, um, for me, I think, um, you know, I never want to come across as arrogant in any way, but I think scoring wise and, and creativity is that is at that level. But I think, um, you know, defensively picking up the floor, you know, they got guys like Doncic in the one, those kind of things is, is how I'm going to have to affect the game. And, I've got to be probably better being able to switch onto bigger guys and, and pushing them out of positions and things. And, you know, there are limitations on, on my size and weight, but um, you know, you look at a guy like Patty and the way he is constantly moving and, and changing direction and how he moves his feet defensively is incredible, but constantly putting pressure on the defense, flying off screens. Um, and, you know, for me internationally, that's something I'd like to do. I'd, I, you know, I could play on the ball, off the ball, fly off screens and shoot or I can play in the ball screen too um, so I think just really fine tuning my game to more towards international level basketball um, the NBL is obviously still incredible too but at an international level when you're facing against some of those national teams it's um, it's definitely a, a big ask and um, you've got to find ways that you can impact at that level and, and hang your hat on it you know you look at a guy like Nick Kay um, one of the best offensive rebounders that we've seen in the NBL and he goes to the Olympics and what does he do? What does he do? He offensive rebounds and carves himself out an incredible role. So, you know, for a guy like myself, it's about finding what you do really well and then transferring that to that next level is, are you able to do that? And, um, you know, that's something I'm constantly working on. Um, talk to us yeah. about getting picked for the Australian team. Obviously, I think, it, I think refresh my memory. I think it was a qualifying cup for the Asia cup or something like that. Yeah, yep, it was the Asia Cup. Um, it that, was that would have been a surreal was, yeah, moment getting awesome. picked for the Aussie team, obviously representing your country and putting them on the green and gold. So talk to us about that. Yeah, it was awesome. It was um, it was a bit of a dream come true to be honest. I mean, I'd done the World Uni Games, I'd done the Emerging Boomers stuff, but never the obviously the national team. And um, to make the team of uh, a really solid NBL team as well, it was. Um, you know, we took a we took a solid team, and I think to make that team and then also perform, I think was really important as well. Just being there, and there's a bit of a different feeling when you put on that jersey. And don't get me wrong, you put on other jerseys, it's incredible, but there is almost this sense of it's bigger than you, and it's bigger than the guys in the room. You know, you you feel like you've got a whole country supporting you, um, and that's it's a really cool weight on your shoulders. It's definitely doesn't weigh you down, but it's, it lifts you up if anything. And I think, yeah, just singing that national anthem and, and hearing the boomers history in the pre locker room and things like it, uh, it's incredible. So I can't wait to do it all again. Um, if I get the opportunity and um, I'm looking forward, I think we've got com games next year. So, um, you know, hopefully putting my best foot forward for that. Um, and yeah, just, just can't wait to get going again. There's, there's no feeling like it. For sure. Um, we'll get into our last segment. We do this every uh, episode. Um, 10 quick questions. It's 10 rapid fire questions. You can use the skip button if you like. Um, answer them at your own pace. First question. What is something you are appreciative of? Can be anything. Uh, family. Common answer. Good one. Uh, number two. Favorite NBA player and why? Uh, Steve Nash. Uh, smooth and smart. Sure. Uh, celebrity crush. Celebrity crush. 
skip. I don't know. I don't want to get in trouble with the misses. <laughs> yeah. Also, common answer. We're not trying to get involved in any of that stuff. <laughs> uh, all right. What shoes are you wearing right now when you're playing? Uh, Puma Nitro, a new, a new hoop shoe by Puma. Nice. Um, favorite NBA team and why? Um, I gotta go the Jazz for my man Joe. Damn. Nice. Who's the most underrated player uh, you know currently? Uh, in the NBL. Can be yeah, we'll go, we'll go domestically. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll go we'll go Australian scene NBL. Even even NBL one or below the NBL, you know, someone that you think that's that's you know putting their hand up. Um, it's tough, man. I think I think one guy that stands out for me is not necessarily, but just the things he can do on the floor that probably go unnoticed. Um, I would say Ruben Tarangi. He really um, he impacts a game a lot, and uh, it probably goes unnoticed. It may not pop up on the stat sheet all the time. Uh, but he Im- impacts the game a lot. Sure, I saw I saw him play well against uh, you guys in the Australian game at Nissan Arena. He played really good at that game, Ruben. <laughs> um, Don't remind hard- me. <laughs> Hardest player you've gone up against? Uh, probably Westbrook. Damn, <laughs> that's a good answer. Can't can't be. Can't, not many players are going to contest for that. Uh, who you think? Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Talk, talk to us about that. When did you guard Westbrook? Yeah, fair enough. Talk to us about that. Uh, we had the OKC and United game. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah, so that was that was crazy. I mean, I probably only spent maybe five, six minutes, but just his speed and change of pace and stuff was. And at that time, he was just shooting a three, crazy too. Like he was shooting like maybe mid thirties. Uh, is it MVP season? So, yeah. He was a he was a problem, but um, it was tough. I couldn't really switch to the two because they had six nine Paul George standing there. So I kind of had to go with Russ. <laughs> That's yeah, crazy. It's, it's pretty funny. Westbrook's a bit of a contentious point amongst like NBA fans and stuff. You either love him or you hate him. But I've heard stories from um, Aaron Bruce, obviously another Australian Australian that's done big things in basketball. He told me he got signed to a ten day at Oklahoma when Westbrook was a rookie. And I was talking to him about it and he was saying that just the stuff he would do, like you'd look over your screen, look over your shoulder to check if there's a screen coming and he'd already reject the screen to be on the rim, just dunking the ball on someone. And he said, anyone that anyone that says anything bad about Westbrook, I dare them to lace up and try and stay in front of him. And then you can tell me what you think about him. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, he's a, he's a nightmare, especially once he gets that, that jumper going too, it's over. Yeah, for mm-hmm. sure. All right, who do you think is winning the NBA 2022 season? Uh, I'm going to go with the Jazz. I think Utah are going to surprise a few people. That's that's a new one. We've had we've had uh, Nets, Bucks, Nuggets. Jazz is the first one on the Jazz. I mean, they finished first in the West last season, so we'll see how they do. Um, who are you most excited to play this upcoming NBL season? The NBL uh, schedule just got released recently. Uh, is there anyone particularly circled on your calendar? Um, oh, I mean, the the throwdowns are always good against United. You know, it's a packed arena. It's uh, it's a bit of a, a show in Melbourne. So definitely got them circled for sure. They're always great games. Nice. And I think there's an obvious one here, but uh, I want to hear it from you. Who's winning the NBL 2022 championship? Phoenix. <laughs> for sure um we'll wrap it up there thank you so much Carl, for joining us uh, we appreciate it um good luck this season we're behind you uh, hopefully you have a huge season hopefully southeast win the chip and you can come back on after you guys win it for sure that'd be awesome thanks for ha- having me fellas nice to meet you guys no worries oh, thank you that was a good episode with kyle adnam um, he's, in, he's due a big season this year with Southeast. Uh, Southeast are a bit of an interesting team, I think, next year. Um, definitely one that I'm a bit unsure about. I think I still need to see how their roster shapes up um, before I can lay down my predictions. Um, what are your thoughts on Southeast Melbourne next year, Hesh? Yeah, I didn't have him penciled in the four, but 
talking to Kyle just then. I get swayed easily, man. He seems mm-hmm. confident. He's talking, talking like they've, they've got, they're in a really good headspace right now and they've processed that loss at the end of last year and they're going to use it in the right way and everyone's kind of ready to go. So, you know, they could catch some teams sleeping for sure. I, I, I can't pick NBL games to save my life, man. This season's going to be a nightmare to try and predict. So I'm just excited to to see them all go at it. And obviously, South East Melbourne could, could catch any team sleep on their night. For sure. Um, keen to see how Kyle Adam goes next year. I um, appreciate you guys for listening. Make sure you subscribe on all, uh, whatever streaming platform you guys are listening on and follow us on Instagram at Uh We hit 500 followers which is huge um, on our separate uh, podcast uh, Instagram. Um, So we'll keep running up the numbers and we will continue to do what we do. We appreciate it um, and we'll catch you on the next episode.